Okay. Uh, well, welcome to Act Two of High Performance Rail, uh, brought to you by the Regional Accelerator at Pinwer. I I don't know about you all, but I was fascinated with that last um, discussion and session. Um, I've been working on as an advocate for rail issues for a long time, and I learned a whole lot uh, about commodities and agriculture. And it's appropriate that we're here in Boise because agriculture is a big deal in Boise and Idaho. And I've always been impressed with how many state legislators are active farmers. So that was great. Uh, before we get into our next session, I, I will let you know that we are recording this in terms of pictures and highlights and slides. And we will be, after uh, the, the conference, we will be probably in late August, early September, we will be circulating the results of this morning and these two rail sessions um, to state legislators in the Pinwar region, uh, our partners in Canada, congressional staff, which are very, very important. I used to work on the Hill and some of the congressional staff don't really understand the, the issues. Um, governor's office um, and, and a whole bunch of other folks. Uh, so we will circulate that all to you because I think it's very, very valuable information. Good. Um, okay, so uh, Elaine Clegg is with the Valley Regional Transit Authority. She's formerly with the a council member um, from the city of Boise and before that was Smart Growth Idaho. And she is really the, the kind of the brain power around regional transit in the Treasure Valley and inner city rail uh, for the Pioneer uh, from Salt Lake uh, uh, to Boise to, to uh, Portland and Seattle. And we have a, a great panel of a couple of legislators and a, and a, uh, a rail operator. Um, and I think it's gonna be very interesting following up on the theme from the first session about looking at this from a passenger rail, either legislative perspective at the state, how does the state invest in rail? How do they take care of the, of the railroads needs to service the ports and the freight and the agricultural interests in the interior. So I'm really looking forward to this session and uh, let's turn it over. Well, thank you, Bruce. Is this working? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for being here. This is great to see such a full room today. Um, we've been working hard to make sure that this was a success. I'd like to point out the two Boise City staff, if they'd raise their hand, who did all the legwork to make this happen. Thank you so much. <laughs> So I'm Elaine Clegg. I served on the Boise City Council for 20 years. I also worked for a nonprofit in Idaho that worked on land use and transportation issues for 25. And last February, I did a crazy thing and uh, accepted the job as CEO of our regional transit authority. It's a two county authority. Right now it's bus based, uh, but we are very much interested in looking at the short line rail corridor that runs through this region and seeing if it would be appropriate and we could make it work for uh, regional high capacity uh, heavy rail transit service. And so um, I've always had an ulterior motive in helping, trying to help bring the uh, Amtrak service back to Boise. And as the mayor of Boise and the mayor of Salt Lake have been working on a state supported corridor between Salt Lake and Boise, um, and that ulterior motive is that I think that in this region, uh, this heavy rail transit corridor could be a game changer for how we move around. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my panelists and invite each of you uh, to briefly introduce yourselves, your name, your title, your organization, and then we'll go through your uh, introduction um, slides. Great to be here, Rob Paget. I'm the managing director of Capital Corridor. We are the agency that uh, manages and has oversight over the service between the Sacramento region and San Jose. Good morning, I'm Representative Jake Five from uh, Tacoma, Washington. Um, and part of my district includes the port of Tacoma. Um, I'm currently the chair of the House Transportation Committee in the Washington State Legislature. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Chris Gorsick. I'm a state senator in the state of Oregon. And uh, 
I am the co-chair of our Joint Transportation uh, Committee, uh, along with my uh, co-chair, um, uh, we do a joint um, session rather than having each one split between the House and the Senate. And uh, I have long been interested in transportation issues uh, from the time that I was a little kid. I was a big, big Southern Pacific Rail fanatic. Um, and now, of course, that's UP. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Johnson. Uh, I'm a recovering railroader. Um, had a career in the public sector, and uh, that included working for a member of Congress uh, with Bruce Agnew, uh, John Miller, former uh, member of Congress from Washington State, um, and uh, also a 10-year stint at the U.S. Department of Transportation at the Volpe Center, and uh, transportation advisor to former Governor of Washington, Gary Locke. And one of the things you learn as a transportation advisor is never to uh, uh, take up too much time when you've got a senator and a House member who are uh, leaders in transportation on the same stage. So very happy to be here. Well, thank you all. We're going to start our presentations with Rob Padgett, who's going to uh, talk about the uh, Northern California corridor, Capital Corridor. And Rob, right. you can either go here or there. It's up to you, whatever's easiest. Okay. It's great to be here today, and I really appreciate the last session. And it does tee up a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. And if you're like me and you have a hard time paying attention in conferences, I'll just give you the punchline right up front, which is I, I hope what you'll take from this presentation is that you, you really need the strong leadership at the state and local level to make stuff happen. I can't stress that enough. And you really need a partnership with the freight railroads. And we heard a lot of that in the last session. And that's certainly been the history of Capital Corridor. Um, I've, I've actually been um, involved in some national stuff. I lived in D.C. for 17 years. I've been in California for a little over five years. And in D.C., I worked for the Northeast Corridor Commission, which was created by Congress back in 2008. Um, and, and I will say, when I was working on a rail in the Northeast Corridor, I did not realize that California had the second and the third busiest rail services in the country. And so I say that to say that... Um, we think that it's really important to have uh, state leadership to, to think about rail in states. I, uh, before I got into the rail business, I did a lot of work as a consultant for state DOTs. I think state DOTs were designed to deliver projects. That's just what they're good at. And I also think they have a really strong connection to the citizens in their state. And it's a real natural change, in my opinion, to see um, rail as a, as a next step for those state agencies. And I personally believe that it's going to be how we're going to keep the rail program going beyond this six year uh, term that we have today. Let's see if I can, is this the switcher here? Okay. Press the green. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about um, Capital Quarter, what we are, and then talk about how we got here. Um, I have a 16 member board. We, we cover a service area of eight counties, including the San, uh, city of San Francisco. We have bus service that connects in San Francisco. And I have two members on my board from each of those counties. And, and, and all of these are elected officials in some way. So a lot of times they are um, a, a county supervisor, then they're appointed to their local transit board. And I have six member um, transit agencies. So they become then a part of the Capital Corridor Board. So it's a it's a little bit of a California mix, but I know every state has different rules in place. But this, this is who I'm accountable to. Um, our, our staff itself is hosted by the Bay Area Rapid uh, Transit District, so that lets me not have to worry about picking out our health insurance every year. I can benefit from their strength in procurement and legal issues. I have a, a board secretary that also serves the, the BART board, makes it really easy to run our operations and really focus on the rail piece. Um, the service itself is operated by Amtrak, so they drive the trains, they operate our stations, they maintain our equipment. Union Pacific is our host railroad for all but uh, two miles of our service area. Caltrain has that last little two miles. The state of California owns the equipment, and um, FRA obviously has regulatory oversight. I can't quite see that there. My eyes aren't quite good enough for that to make sure I got everything. 
And a little bit about our service area. So 170 mile corridor, we're the only public transportation service that uh, serves all of Northern California. So we have a lot of connections to local transit agencies up and down the corridor. Um, but if you wanna go from Sacramento to the Bay Area, this is how you're gonna travel. It's the only service that exists that provides that. Um, and, and as I said, we make those connections really easy to transit services. Believe it or not, we had little paper transfer tickets until, until COVID that let you get on um, other services in the region, but we're building on that as we go forward. And then I, and I wanna point to the, bar, the um, pie chart in the corner here, and, and this is my advice to everybody here, is really think about your markets. So about a third of my customers today are um, traveling for work purposes. That used to be about 70%. Um, we had a lot of these super long distance commuters that were traveling on our service, but we also have a really strong market for uh, people having leisure travel, either tourists or uh, visiting family. We provide an important connection, which I, I know I heard this morning. It's really important and I think is important for a lot of communities is rail provides really the only access. Um, maybe rail service is minimal or uh, it doesn't exist at all in a community. Um, so really think about that market before you're thinking about what service you want to provide, and then think about how that might change over time as it as it is with my service. Actually, I was ahead. Of, I was ahead a little bit. Um, so 30, 30 uh, round trips on weekdays, 22 on weekends. We're actually uh, operating just 24 right now. Um, we're still kind of coming back from COVID. Um, we are um, carrying about 1.1 million riders. Right now, we actually hit 1.8 million riders back in uh, 2019, our first, uh, our last full year pre-COVID. And, and just to put in perspective, uh, the dollars, I want folks to think realistically about the dollars. Uh, right now, we have an operating subsidy of about $40 million in FY23, and that's, that's way up. We were at about 24 million pre-COVID, and so we're, we're working through some challenges on that. And right now we're carrying about 17 million in, in fair revenue. We were in the high 30s, we were like 37 million our last uh, pre-COVID pre year. So how do, we, how do we get to this place? And you know, what I, what I wanna impart on everybody, and the reason I made this trip today is, um, I'm active in national organizations, the States for Passenger Rail Coalition, I'm the chair of the State Amtrak Intercity Passenger Rail Committee. Um, I want more states to be like California and we need that strength in Washington and we need that strength in our industry. So uh, I'll say to anybody here, call me, uh, I'll connect you to my team. I tell my team, if you learn something, share it with everybody else. Don't, but we're not gonna keep stuff behind closed doors. We want you to learn from us and, and do good things as a result. So, um, so this will give you a sense of, of where we started and how we ended up where we are today. And it really goes back to 1991 the voters in California passed a bond package that provided funding for rail. And that was the start. So we started service right away. It was, it was actually managed by Caltrans, which is the DOT in California. That happened for a few years. I think there was a sense that the DOT wasn't really nimble enough to take on this service. So they created this, the assembly uh, and, and legislature in Sacramento created the Joint Powers Authority back in 1998. And so we took over that service. So the 90s was about um, creating the service. We actually made uh, an investment of several hundred million dollars between, especially between Sacramento and Oakland. And as a result, we have the rights of 20 round trips in that segment. But we made a huge investment in the 90s. And we did that in partnership with the freight railroads. And, and again, the, the great advantage of the state is the state has the interest in both the freight, net, freight network and the passenger rail network. So we're thinking about all those things as we're making those investments. And then in the 2000s, we really grew our service. So that's, that was the period where we went from a handful of round trips daily to a, a tremendous number of round trips. And then in the, and in the teens, we uh, turned to technology. So if, if you've ever uh, ridden an Amtrak train and you bought your ticket with electronic ticketing, we did that in partnership with Amtrak. So we were an incubator for a lot of these innovative things that you'll see on trains now. The Wi-Fi on trains, we were the first to do that out in California. Um, and we did things as simple as um, sending customer notifications out. So we've really embraced technology as a service. And I would, I would argue that one of the things states can do is we can embrace um, innovations. That, that might be um, in things like project delivery, it might be in technology on, on our services. And then in, um, in the 2020s, we're, we're just hanging on. So 
uh, pandemic was a crazy, crazy time. What it did do, though, is it helped us see places where we needed to make some changes. It also brought all the states together um, and I think uh, helped us all learn from each other as we tried to figure out how the heck we're gonna um, handle this crazy crisis that's hit our budget so hard. But the other thing that we're working on now is we're getting to a next generation of pair, fair payment. So we're, uh, we're piloting a program now where you can walk on with your credit card, tap it on the train when you get on, tap it on the train when you get off, it calculates your fare. You might transfer to the transit service in Sacramento, tap, tap in Sacramento, all that stuff's behind the scenes. Our goal in California is to deliver as much service to as many people as we can. It's, a, it's an equity strategy, it's a climate strategy, and it's an economic development strategy. So the easier we can make uh, rail travel and the connections to our local transit systems, the better. And this gives you a sense of um, levels of service. So this goes back to the early 90s um, when we started with just six trains a day. Um, and we, as we grew that service rapidly in the early 2000s, you can see that um, over the last couple of years, we unfortunately did have to cut our service. We did it dramatically, uh, very quickly in part because of health concerns and, and then did carry a lot of that service. It really helped us think about what is our core service as we're moving forward. We are working to restore our full service going forward. And Adrian talked a, a bit about um, one of the really big projects for us is expanding our service as we go out past Sacramento into the uh, suburbs, Roseville area outside of Sacramento with a third track project. So we're gonna, we're gonna continue to grow. And I, and I will say that um, you see here ridership followed as well. We got up to um, 1.8 million riders back in 2019. So you start small and you grow fast. So how are we different from other uh, state rail services? And, and, and in some ways, some other services have some of these same characteristics. We have direct control over our schedules, our fare policies, and our marketing. So um, in some cases, states pay the subsidy, but they don't have this level of control. Amtrak sets the schedule, Amtrak sets the fares, um, Amtrak does the marketing. That's all done at Capital Corridor. So we um, obviously do that in partnership with Amtrak, but largely we're working with Union Pacific staff when we're making changes to schedule. Um, we own all the equipment in California. So back in the 90s when this service was started, we went out and purchased all that equipment. And um, one of the things that you likely know about California is we're really aggressive on the environmental side, on the emissions side. I'm required to go to zero emissions faster than anybody is in the, in the country, including Amtrak. So we're already working on a strategy to move that quickly. It also just gives us a ton of control over our equipment. Um, it doesn't shift from one service to another. It stays in my corridor. We have control over that. Um, we also have done um, all of the project planning and delivery um, at Capital Corridor and, and with the partnership with the state of California. So um, there's a lot of excitement about IJA. I'm super excited about it. Uh, we've done this entirely with state dollars. So um, 30 years, I can't even imagine what we could have accomplished if we could leverage something like IJA. Um, but, but it can happen at the state level. And I would argue again, you've got to have local ownership, local buy-in to those services. Um, we also have a lot of direct communications with our customers. And then um, the thing that's, that's really unique about our service, and, and Adrian uh, got ahead of me a little bit on this, is that we have a unique partnership with Union Pacific Railroad. We, we established uh, um, incentive payments for on-time performance that, that, that do not necessarily exist in other places. But more importantly, we invest in capital. So we have uh, a tracking that we pay for. Um, we uh, just replaced a, a signal system because we benefit from that immensely. Uh, we're working on another signal system, we're working on sidings, and that's just the little stuff. So we've got big stuff that's going, in addition to that, we're working in partnership with Union Pacific. But what we try to do is we see the problem, uh, we work with our uh, folks at Union Pacific that know this stuff, we meet on a quarterly basis and talk about it, and we look for opportunities to jointly fund projects. And we contribute what's, what's reasonable for the public benefit of that project, and we work together on um, the degree to which a project is, has a public benefit, sometimes it's 100%, sometimes it's 50%, sometimes it's 10%. But, 
but we have done this over the years. We have a great trust in Union Pacific, and I, I can't say enough about how positive that relationship has been. And so here's my advice. I like giving advice. So um, it's, it's worth it. So it's a lot of work. Um, don't get me wrong, um, but it is worth it. It takes time. Um, I'm excited to see so many of you here today. Um, really, as I said before, think about travel markets. Um, for us, it's also things like access to healthcare in San Francisco. That's a really big part of our business. Um, I didn't mention earlier. Invest in state resources. I can't stress it enough. You've got to have more than one person working at the state DOT. I work with all the state DOTs across the country that are doing rail service. And there are, there are some of these that are really, really strong. And I've got some on the list here, including Washington and in Oregon. Lean on those partners um, and think about how you might uh, get organized in your own state or community to make sure you have the institutional capability to really engage, um, engage in starting new service or expanding service. And then keep that uh, relationship with the host, host railroads positive. And then the last thing I'll say, and I think this varies a little bit, and I've had some conversations this morning that, that give me a little bit of a second thought on this one, but you know, we, we started small and we built on that. Um, we, we, we had the support from the community, we invested, we grew the service over time, then we made all sorts of other improvements. And I do think it's a, this is a way to show people that you can deliver and then build that support long-term. You're going to be, uh, if, you're, if you're providing support for state-supported services, you're going to provide the subsidy for that service, and you've got to have support from your community and show that you can actually deliver. That's my last slide, and that's going to do it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Look forward to questions. Thank you, Rob. That was an uh, incredible introduction. We're really excited to um, start asking questions in a bit. Andrew, um, I'm going to turn to you. I don't know if you have slides or if you're just... I think in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, spare the room more slides. I think um, what I want to do is just offer some uh, high clip comments, and that'll get us uh, sooner, perhaps, into a, a discussion and dialogue, which I th always think is uh, most valuable. Um, so we, uh, I, I lead a firm, the Columbia Group, um, that is comprised of former railroaders, retired railroaders. Um, uh, I had uh, 15, 16 years with BNSF. I led uh, state government affairs and local government affairs or community affairs for BNSF uh, as assistant vice president. Uh, Daryl Ness, 40-plus uh, year a veteran of BNSF, a uh, senior operating guy, general manager of the Pacific Northwest Division, the Southwest Division, lots of other uh, leadership positions and operations. Uh, Blaine Bilderback, uh, who led real estate and right-of-way issues for BNSF for over 30 years, uh, and also uh, Pat Thompson, uh, senior marketing and economic development uh, leader at BNSF with over 30 years. So together, what we bring is a perspective of class one railroading and railroading in general that can be helpful for clients as they're uh, seeking to uh, you know, solve a problem, pursue a challenge, work with a railroad and, and find good solutions. We were pr privileged uh, to join Penoir in um, uh, the effort to uh, apply for and seek uh, designation as a regional infrastructure accelerator. And you've all heard the news about that. That was wonderful. And over the past year, we have been doing some really great spade work in um, what that means for the Northwest. And our early success was uh, championing a um, grade separation project in the Spokane Valley, Pines Road. You've heard a little bit about that. That project was frankly languishing for 20 years. It had been on, on lists, but it just couldn't get traction. A really valuable uh, grade separation that will reconnect both sides of the community that are separated by the BNSF main line. And this project um, was put on the deferred list of the State Freight Mobility Strategic Investment Board. It just it was having a hard time, had applied for federal grants, and uh, we were invited to come in and, and kind of uh, roll up our sleeves and take a look at it, offer some technical advice. Train counts were a little bit off and also the nature of the train traffic. Uh, and just to uh, drill down just for a moment, this at grade crossing immediately to its 
um, west had a switch and half the traffic, the train traffic was starting from a dead stop. So imagine if you're a community that is seeking a grade separation and you've got 60 or 70 trains a day, but those trains are moving at track speed, 59 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, whatever it may be. Well, that's a whole lot different than 30 or 40 of those total number of trains per day that's starting from a dead stop. And it's still a full unit grain train or something of that sort. And on the other side of that crossing, just down uh, the tracks about uh, five or 10 miles is one of the major fueling facilities for BNSF in the Northwest. So trains are queuing up. A lot of competing and, and a, um, really compounding challenges for that crossing. We were able to help uh, that project along and it won a, a terrific, as you've heard earlier, a $22, $23 million uh, federal grant, raise grant. And now that project with some other uh, partnership funding, it's, it's on a pathway to move toward construction. So an early win, I would suggest that that is an example, grade separations in general, are a terrific example of what we're, a concept that we're coining, which we would call high performance rail. It's common sense. And I go back to a keynote address that uh, our former, uh, BNSF's former president, chairman, and CEO, Matt Rose, gave to a Penoir uh, annual conference at Big Sky and his message was that back in the, uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, Central Puget Sound had a program called the Fast Corridor Program. Some of you remember this. I see some heads nodding. It was a tremendous success. It had uh, communities, ports, railroads, trucking companies, uh, everybody coming together to recognize that there were needed improvements, grade separations, track geometry, whatever the project was needed improvements along a corridor that were prioritized, and if everybody put their shoulder to the wheel, you could then knock those projects out one after another through whatever funding source was made available. There was a lot of state funding involved, a lot of federal funding involved. And it was a great way to organize the thinking and, and make really substantial progress from a corridor perspective. So you're moving, you're, you're increasing velocity, you're moving more freight, moving people. Uh, it was a great success story. And Matt Rose's message to Penoir at that annual conference in Big Sky was, let's turn it on its axis and think about a fast corridor program for the region, for the whole Pacific Northwest. Um, and I think that idea is reflected in high performance rail. It's logic, it's, also recognizing that if you are a passenger rail advocate, your pathway to any sort of realization of your goals is ensuring that that host freight railroad is able to succeed. And what does that mean? It means partnering, it means shoulder, putting your shoulder to the wheel to help a project that may be really a freight project, but again, it's about velocity and getting those freight trains moving so that passenger service can also potentially uh, have a role in, in moving people. So um, if you think about that idea and the notion of uh, what we can do together, better together, um, think about a corridor and how we could bundle maybe small projects, and conceptually we're working on this idea now, where you could take small projects that maybe by themselves are a bit of a yawner but when you put them together, targeted in areas where you're recognizing there's you know, chronic delay, then together you could move the needle. You could generate new capacity and improve ridership, uh, or not ridership, but uh, run times. So you're able to bring greater consistency and faster uh, run times for passengers, passenger service, but you're also moving those freight trains and it's not just infrastructure, but it's also operational tweaks and adjustments that may be um, possible. So together, better together, we can do some things that enable freight to thrive, because again, and I would argue that from a public policy perspective, when we think about the goals that we want to achieve in moving people, those same goals are profoundly accomplished 
by moving freight, right? Think about it. We can haul freight, railroads can haul one ton of freight 500 miles on one gallon of fuel. Reduces emissions, reduces uh, energy consumption, traffic congestion, um, whether it's a grade separation or you're just moving freight better and faster. We can achieve a lot of really important public policy goals, and those are the same goals that we also want to accomplish when we're moving people. So um, we're honored to work with uh, Penwar and, and the RIA. We're, our job is to provide uh, technical assistance, and we're doing that in a number of areas, helping uh, short lines sort through uh, funding challenges, opportunities to pursue uh, maybe an infrastructure improvement, and bringing to bear at least a greater awareness and understanding of some federal innovative financing tools that may be a good resource to help them get there. But whether that's the solution or not, but just providing some technical assistance uh, to help them uh, move the train down the tracks. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Fascinating stuff. I'm going to now turn to Senator Gorsuch. And I wonder if you could tell us the stuff that you've been working on with the Oregon legislature and, and successes or challenges. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, I've been in the uh, legislature since 2013, but I'm only in my first term um, in the Senate. Um, but I've worked on transportation issues for a long time while I was there. Um, my background is also um, uh, academic. I have a um, strong background in both geography and also urban studies. Went to the uh, or School of Urban Studies at Portland State University, which dealt with a lot of these sorts of issues. Um, I, I just want to reiterate what has been said this morning about collaboration. Um, and it was very nicely brought up in the previous panel. We can't make the system better without collaboration. And that collaboration, just to reiterate what's already been said, has to be public and private. And it has to be, when you're talking public, local, state, federal. And that's the fascinating thing about the system. Um, it's very much like if you look at a city. Cities don't necessarily control everything that goes on. There are you know, lighting districts and maybe water districts and all these other things. But we face a similar sort of thing when we're trying to run a transportation system. And unfortunately, many times uh, I've kind of heard the, uh, the comments that, well, they're a private company, right? I'm sure you've heard that. Um, and, and why, back to that question that you asked before, which is why would we give money um, to these private folks? Well, we do a lot of public-private partnerships. In fact, they're extremely important um, in many ways. But this system, with all of those parts that I just talked about, is not monolithic. For instance, go within any of them, and what do you find? Another layer of complexity, or two, or three. Um, and so when people, for instance, talk about the legislature, um, that's us, the House and the Senate, but that doesn't mean that we all agree. It also doesn't mean that if we agree, the governor agrees, um, which we've seen a few of these cases recently in Oregon. Um, and it's the same thing in any business. It doesn't mean that because you know, some of the corporate um, executives want to do something that that will necessarily happen based upon uh, internal political and economic decisions. So it's, I'm just struck by how complex it all is. And frequently the way we talk about it makes it sound so much simpler. Um, and I think that's why many times the public gets so frustrated because it's like, oh, well, you, you know, you want better passenger service, so go ahead, fix that rail system. But it's not that simple. And we've talked a lot about um, grade separation. The other one um, that I've heard uh, a lot about in the last uh, few years talking to rail folks, um, especially at UP and BNSF, um, is the siding situation where you need to get a train out of the way so that another train can pass. Obviously, you know that. Um, but 
the uh, the one thing that's been a little bit lacking in this morning's conversation um even though i love the class ones don't get me wrong but and that's where amtrak is primarily running but we also have a significant impact from short lines and uh, the state of oregon relies quite a bit on uh, portland at, well it's genovese and wyoming but we call it portland and western um, and that was spun off from the old Southern Pacific. So there's a lot of economic development and economic vitality that comes off of that system. Unfortunately, that's the system that probably needs the most care and repair. Um, if you think about the fact that they were spun off, there were good reasons for that. Um, economically and so one of the things that we've been trying to do in the legislature and and I think you brought up connect Oregon is getting some projects that will help all of the railroads um, I'm not satisfied with the amount of funding that we have for connect Oregon but that's a that's a perennial legislative uh, complaint um, the other thing is you know the public and the private and why give them money um, Ironically, I had to fly here, right, from Portland to get to this conference. Uh, and in the past, I actually rode on the Pioneer. I was able to take the Pioneer um, to Chicago and back. Um, so it's kind of ironic to go to a rail conference in a venue where you have to fly. And, you know, Alaska is wonderful, but still, um, it's, it's weird. The other thing that's, and we have that problem a lot of, uh, across a lot of the West. The other thing is, though, think about the amount of money that we give to airports. And when I say we, I'm talking about the federal government, uh, present company accepted. But I mean, you think about how much money we invest. Right now, I don't know if you've seen it, but PDX seems to think that it needs a giant wooden ceiling um, to somehow make your travel better personally i'd like to see more trains and uh, forego the wooden ceiling but you know that's me um, but if we can do it for those airports we need the same mindset for any of the transportation um, it was brought up earlier what was the other thing highways right we do a lot of federal money with highways so to go and say well the railroads that's different i i don't see it that way um, and so I think that we need kind of a new mindset. We need a bolder way of thinking about things with our goal being, oh, I'm not trying to give a bunch of money to BNSF. I'm trying to move freight and I'm trying to move people in a way that really makes sense and it's quicker. So that's, that's one of the things that, that I'm now, now I'll probably get a terrible uh, seat on the plane going back, um, but at any rate, <laughs> <laughs> the um, the other thing is that um, you know we formed um, my friend uh, Lewis and I had discussions a couple of years ago about the fact that the Washington Legislature has a rail caucus, which you were a part of, um, and so two years ago this August we uh, formed one in the state of Oregon, and the awesome thing about that is that it's bipartisan. It's bicameral. It's a topic that captures across the aisle a lot of people's interests and concerns. And the great thing is that, um, you know, we have about 20 members out of a 90 member legislature, 30 in the House and 60 in the, or 60 in the House and 30 in the Senate. So um, that I think signals some very, um, serious concern and interest in uh, rail. Um, and the one last thing that I think is super important besides the economic impacts, um, but also equity. You know, um, we've seen bus service dwindle. We've seen air service dwindle, um, but we still have a lot of areas where uh, important long distance routes either do or used to serve um, rural communities. And that's something that I think we really need to focus on. And remember, right now, even though my Department of Transportation doesn't always agree with us, but 
there's potentially a lot of ways to improve rails service and infrastructure based on the federal money that's coming from the federal government. And this is a time to really think clearly in big ways, how can we fix these railroads so that they can, can, can um, coincide passenger and freight. It's a time to really have big, solid ideas. And I, and I you know, to come to a, a conference like this where there are so many people in the room, um, frequently when we talk about this back home, it's, uh, well, there's a few of us and there's a lot of crickets. So um, I'm so glad that you're all here and interested and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, that's fascinating. So uh, Representative Fye, let's hear about the state of Washington and then we'll go to questions. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, you've got two politicians up here and I don't know how much time there's gonna be for questions. So, um, and sometimes we'd actually don't want the questions. But anyway, um, I, just, I do wanna acknowledge, um, you know, in the state of Washington, um, as uh, the good senator mentioned, we do have a rail caucus, and we do actually in the audience have one of the co-chairs, Representative Levitt from the Pierce County, is one of those four co-chairs, and I actually have my one of my uh, vice chairs uh, for the Transportation com uh, Committee, Representative Donaghy, here today. Washington does things different than any other state that I'm aware of with respect to transportation. We have a transportation commission, but the transportation commission only deals really with ferry fares and tolling rates. Um, the decisions on the budget go through a transportation committee who also does the policy work. And we um, decide projects. We also are the ones that develop the momentum and pass um, additional revenues uh, for transportation. So, and we decide projects on a biennial basis. So we are as in to the budget and as in to the policy as, as any state in the country. Um, there's good and bad things about that. Um, but I think it has to be mentioned because, because decisions are made differently in the state of Washington, they might otherwise in other other states. Um, you asked about talking about a little bit of the latest and greatest. Um, the in 2022, we passed a 16 billion dollar transportation package um, with no gas tax increase, um, but actually money from the operating budget um, alternatively to that, um, and we doing some new things in, uh, that have an intersection, uh, particularly with rail. Um, we own a short line railroad in Eastern Washington, and we're put more money into helping improvements be made in that with the money that we received. Uh, we have a loan and grant program. It's called Fripp and Frap, sort of like Cheech and Chong. And they, um, they make loans and grants um, to particularly to short line railroads. Um, I actually was on the governing board for a couple of years for a municipal short line railroad. Um, very important, as the Senator has described, um, with our resources from our carbon uh, legislation, uh, we passed, um, I think, maybe for one of a kind kind of effort where kids ride free on Amtrak within the state of Washington in order to encourage that new generation of ridership. Uh, we also passed a special program to deal with railroad crossings, uh, dedicated money just for that purpose. So otherwise, in our budget, because of the state constitution, and I think it, it, it is in other states as well, uh, you cannot spend highway money on rail. And so that, that means that the other revenues, which are largely vehicle fees, are those compete with other, what I would call multimodal activities, whether it's transit or active transportation. So um, anyway, so 
pretty momentous kind of effort. We did a $16 billion package in 2015. Seven years later, we do another one. Um, we are very much assisted by the carbon funding. Um, it allows us to do an investigation on ultra high speed rail. Um, I don't believe that could pass our legislature at this point in time, but we're going to take a look at it. Um, but we also, in this last session, um, we did uh, a, an upgrade of our uh, freight mobili mobility strategic investment board. That's a mouthful. Um, and we did that because it wasn't strategic. It was all about projects. It wasn't identifying the biggest needs in the state of Washington to help the movement of freight. So we basically turned that upside down. They still will have some authority to give us recommendations for projects, but they won't do it on the basis of who, who comes in and who has the resources to put together an application, but to strategically look at what the most important things that need to be done that will facilitate that. By way of example, no one has ever sent in a proposal to deal with truck parking. Truck parking is a big problem in our state, and I imagine it is in, in uh, other states. So now we'll be able to, to do some more work and be strategic about our investment. Um, just by way of conclusion here, I have some observation is that we really need to look at things in an integrated fashion, particularly for our ports, and to take the best advantage of rail in servicing those ports. Uh, we have a project in my district, my, uh, my Port of Tacoma district uh, does not have a direct uh, highway link into the port, so it has to travel through local roads. That, is, that inhibits the growth of that port. Um, we need to in reduce conflicts between rail and, and um, highway traffic and passenger traffic. I've had, in the last 10 years, two individuals die because of not being cautious enough when crossing railroad tracks while they were out recreating um, in, in our city. So um, safety is a big issue too. We didn't talk much about that, but it is a big issue as, as we um, try to put as much infrastructure into certain geography, there's going to be conflicts. And we would do want to make sure that whether it is um, a, a rail to rail problem uh, in terms of an accident or whether it's a rail person problem, uh, we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to identify those areas of conflict. So I'll wrap it up with that and be happy to answer any questions along with the rest of the panel. Well, thank you. You did leave a little bit of time for questions. Thank all of you. I think you, you know, really good background for this discussion. Before I start with questions, I wanted to recognize a group that has worked hard over the last couple of years to push uh, the idea of passenger rail forward, and that is the Greater Northwest Passenger Rail um, Working Group. A bunch of them are out in the audience. Raise your hands. Thank you all for working so hard to move this, this issue forward and, and help us organize this summit today. So Rob and Andrew, I want to start with a question for you. What are the biggest challenges in creating these high performance corridors where freight and rail actually and passenger can work well together um, seamlessly? And on the flip side, what are the opportunities that you see right now uh, to make this better? It isn't. Oh, it is good. OK. Um, yeah, so, so um, I would say biggest, I'm going to start with biggest opportunity, start with a positive, which is I think the market is enormous um, for this service. And I, um, as I mentioned, I, I worked in the Northeast Corridor uh, previously, and in that job, I was riding up and down the Northeast all the time. And what I saw was businesses that had relocated some of their back office, say, say from New York to New Haven or, or Wilmington, Delaware, and just the amount of commerce that was going on in that system was really extraordinary. And I would say with extremely high rates, like if you look at the, the charges that they have for um, fares in the Northeast Corridor, it is really high. Um, and, and, I would, um, it, and I would say that what's different about our service and, and, and going to the issue of challenge, my challenge right now is, is operating funding. 
And it is, because um, we are in a really tough spot, even in California where we do have a lot of, like, like a lot of places we have a lot of capital dollars, the operating dollars are tighter. And unfortunately, the costs have escalated quite a bit. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, more innovative approaches to delivering service um, that we haven't seen yet. So I'm, my hope is that I can keep those fares really low because our goal is to serve everybody. It's, it's uh, not to serve the top of the market, but to really serve everybody. And I think our challenge long term is going to be um, figuring out how to operate this service more efficiently going forward. Thank you. Andrew, what kinds of things are you seeing? Well, uh, <laughs> the theme for any conference like this these days is um, we are seeing uh, a level of funding that we've really never seen before, right? And uh, for the first time, and it's not just funding, but it's funding that is targeted in really important ways. For the first time, you're really seeing a dedicated uh, grade separation program, for example, at the federal level. And um, I, I think the ability for a corridor in the Northwest to be sealed, the term used when you know that there are no at-grade crossings, where the rail corridor is truly sealed from any uh, at-grade intersection with uh, vehicular traffic, very hard to do. Prohibitively expensive, I would think, given um, our needs and, and probably not necessary. But the ability to move forward on grade separations in a way that we've never been able to do before because funding is now present is a golden opportunity. I think we all get that. Um, we need to seize upon that. Um, and then I would also say that despite massive investment in um, highways, freeways, roadways, county roads, whatever the, um, the um, road service may be or which jurisdiction it falls under, we need those, but it's, it's, it's sort of a necessary but not sufficient. We still have, at the day you open new general purpose or toll lanes, wherever they may be, it's not enough. And the future, uh, whether it's moving more freight, and I'm very keen on the idea of using this multimodal transportation system of ours in its optimal way. So heavy freight needs to move by rail. Now, it may be that in some instances, especially with intermodal service, that train trip begins and ends with a truck. So it's got to be coordinated. It's got to be multimodal. That makes perfect sense. But let's use the system optimally. So let's get the heavy freight on rail and use trucks for um, uh, port access and those things that keep the commerce moving, deliveries and, and that sort of thing. And uh, again, you know, your ability to get to work on time, uh, if you're if you're dependent on a highway system, is uh, increasingly going to be prohibitive. And that's why we are seeing more and more solutions uh, that involve a partnership with rail and underscore partnership, as we have all said. It's not going to happen. It can't happen because we don't want to compromise freight in trying to achieve passenger. But that in working together, we can do it. Thank you. One quick question for uh, the representative and the senator. Um, is there advice that you would give the other states and provinces in the room about how to form a rail caucus and how to be effective as a legislature in moving these uh, issues forward in a bipartisan way? Um, I think that the important thing is to first bring up the subject. It's uh, a lot of times that uh, I think we come to talking about rail at the legislative level and assume that not very many people are going to be interested. What we found when we brought it up um, and began organizing this was that there's all kinds of interest. And even if we, uh, we also found that even if we have people that didn't join the rail caucus, they were willing to work with us on particular um, rail issues. So, for instance, in working on uh, some advocacy for the Pioneer uh, route, um, the uh, senator from Northeast Oregon, he's not a part of the Rail Caucus, but he definitely 
helped us in a big way in terms of getting out and doing outreach. So I think the very first thing is to, is to talk about it and make sure that they understand that it is both freight and passenger and that it's a collaborative process, that we're not trying to just um, make it nice for one section of the state. Uh, I'm sure that um, Representative Fay can uh, talk about this as well. In Oregon, um, there's a tendency for us to think that everything is just for the Willamette Valley. And so we have to, it, personally, I would like to see a state rail authority that would work on issues all around the state uh, rather than leaving it to um, an undernourished Department of Transportation um, person or two. Um, but that's the sort of thing that you have to do. And the other thing, of course, is to get leadership involved in it too. And in fact, in our case, we were able to get the, um, um, the um, majority leader in the House to join the caucus. So it definitely helps to have those things. Thank you, Representative. Sure, um, and I would agree with what a lot of has been said by the Senator. Um, I think the challenge, each state's different, and so the approach in Washington needs to be different than the approach in Oregon in terms of working um, with the executive branch and with the legislature, and in the case of Oregon, with the commission. Uh, I heard something today that I thought was very instructive, which was, and, it's, and it makes a lot of sense because it's, it's how you get things done, is to make sure that there's a lot of dialogue with, with the railroad companies. Um, they're, not, they're not the enemy, um, and they have their own set of pressures in terms of, of being able to make sure that commodities, which we all rely on, are delivered on time and um, at a cost that, that consumers can afford. Um, so understanding um, the rail operation, uh, if you're an advocate for passenger rail, I think is, is highly important and the constraints they have with the system. Um, you know, we have a sound transit runs on head to heavy rail between um, Lakewood and Everett and um, that's part of, part of the challenges that, that we have with rail is to accommodate that, that activity. But the other part is um, pay attention to a lot of the legislators and do your work um, with, with the full body, whether it's the rail caucus or whether it's the transportation committee members. We passed our budget unanimously, bipartisan prepared, bipartisan approved. Um, so there's a lot of voices in there and just simply going and figuring you can chat with the chair and uh, it takes more than that. It needs broad support in order for it to make it all the way through through the process. Thank you. We uh, are exactly can I, can I at add time. one thing really oh, quick? Okay, one um, real quick thing. The other thing is that uh, you want to include the lobbyists for BNSF and UP, and I'll tell you what, we got, we have gotten some great information for the Rail Caucus from the Union Pacific lobbyists who put together this immense set of information about railroads, not just UP, but about all railroads in Oregon. So that's another a good piece to it. Great advice. Lunch doesn't start until 12.15, so if you're willing, um, we can take a few more questions if you don't mind staying just a few minutes. Bruce? Sure, and I've got a couple quick announcements after that, so go ahead with some questions. Go ahead with some. With a couple of quick questions well, first, or you go yeah, ahead with your Yeah, let's do a couple quick questions, and we've got some announcements about the next year's session, so okay. go ahead. So a couple of quick questions have come over the WOVA app. Um, one is, can passenger and rail service be implemented on a for-profit basis? Why or why not? Does anyone want to comment on that one? Yeah, so I, I do want to comment on that. Um, I, I would say if you, if you want to operate a passenger service that's, that's broadly available to the public, that it cannot operate on a for-profit basis. Um, I think if you, um, if you look at the example of the Northeast Corridor, which theoretically operates on a, on a <clears throat> cash-positive basis, 
um, and you look at the, the folks that are served by that service, their, their fares are, are multiples uh, in, in cost as compared to my fares. Um, we make a conscious decision in California to operate with a fare structure that is accessible to most people. And I suspect, especially hearing a little bit about the markets that are, are of interest here, um, that's gonna be the case in this territory. But I'll say, if you look at all the external benefits of rail service, and we've heard a lot about that today, and you think about all the value that that brings, it absolutely is worth the subsidy that's coming from the state. Looks like Andrew has a quick comment. Yeah, thank you, I was just gonna add, um, you know, when we all look at examples that we want to see replicated, if you're a passenger rail advocate, uh, you look at Europe and Southeast Asia, right? You travel and you ride, you know, the Tejia Bay or something and you're moving at two or 300 miles an hour and isn't that wonderful? And why can't we have that in the United States? There's a lot of reasons. We don't have time to get into it all. A lot of reasons why that is exceedingly challenging to occur in the United States. Major uh, urban centers are much further apart than they are in Europe or Southeast Asia. But among that long list is who owns the corridor? Who owns the right of way? And what is the priority? And so if you want to move people, what Europeans and Southeast Asians and other people all over the world have done is said, you know what? It's a priority. We're going to subsidize it. So. If you're going to accomplish that, I think I'm echoing, Rob, your, your comments, that it's a public good and a public good requires an investment. And um, we are blessed in the United States with what the World Bank and lots of the really smart people have concluded, which is the world's most cost-effective and efficient freight rail network on the planet. But it's a different kind of rail service. And so it's, just as you have said, Oregon has one, you know, uh, approach. Washington may have another. Um, those examples that we look to are really wonderful and attractive, but they're different. And so we have to understand the differences and then work through that. Thank you. We have one more question about moving freight and passenger together. Uh, an example in Alaska. We're actually <coughs> going to hear a lot about that ne at next year's conference. So I'm going to let Bruce. Um, talk briefly about that at, in his comments, but before we go there, I'd like all of you to give these great panelists a hand. Um, really appreciate having you here and what we learned. Bruce. Okay, uh, excuse me, lunch will be at 12.15, but before you go to lunch next door, uh, get your phones out um, or your appointment calendars. Mark these dates, July 20th, to 24th, I think I've got that right. Um, we are hosting the next Pinware Summit in Whistler, British Columbia. And 14 years ago, I was involved um, when Pinware was, was very engaged um, with expanding Amtrak Cascades, the second train to Vancouver during the 2010 Olympic Games at Whistler in Vancouver. And we are a binational organization. And we are very much looking forward um, in Whistler, number one, to get people there by train. So we'll be working with the WashDOT and Amtrak Cascades, ODOT, BNSF, Rocky Mountaineer, which operates a train from uh, Vancouver up to Whistler to try to get as many delegates there by train. So we have a year to organize that. We are also gonna be hearing, uh, as we heard our question earlier, the Alaska Railroad, which was going to be here but had to cancel last minute because they're celebrating their 100 year anniversary uh, it's a fascinating railroad it hauls local people it hauls uh, dome cars from may to october of cruise ship passengers and magnificent scenery and it haul, you know it, it hauls freight and what what's really cool about alaska railroad is that you'll be traveling in bitterly cold winter and there's a little little thing you pull and, you, and the train stops and people get off and they hike off into the snow. It's, it's unbelievable, whistle stop. It's really a, a cool railroad. We're also gonna be hearing and engaged with Rocky Mountaineer, one of my favorite, uh, favorite railroads in the world. Rocky Mountaineer operates um, and it's been recognized by Travel Magazine, one of the premier luxury tra train services. Uh, it operates from Vancouver to Jasper and Banff. Um, 
It was operating briefly between Seattle to Vancouver and then beyond. Uh, and now it is operating a tourist train from Colorado, uh, Denver to Moab, Utah. And we have been actively talking to Rocky Mountaineer about extending into the Northwest. It's, it's a great railroad, it's a great experience. Uh, back in 2005, they hosted the Cascadia Mayor's Council. We had 50 mayors and went to, to Whistler by train. And there was a helicopter that came up on, on the deep gorge and filmed us for a, a national commercial uh, uh, for the, the launching of that service. Uh, so very excited. Also, we've been working with our Alberta delegation and our Alaska and Yukon delegation to talk about the movement of critical minerals from the interior uh, in Alberta, Yukon, Northwest Territories to tidewater ports uh, in Alaska. And uh, we have Senator McCabe here from chairs the Alaska Transportation Committee. Um, Senate Transportation Committee, we're gonna be talking about that. So we're gonna continuing Senator Winder's themes of economic security, critical minerals to uh, world-class ports. So uh, it's gonna be a great session. And I, what can I say about Whistler? It's a pretty cool place. So um, the final thing I'll, I'll mention is from two to five o'clock today, if you're not on the policy tours, we have an opportunity for you to meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, from two to five with uh, US Department of Transportation representatives from the Build America Bureau, uh, Carl and Sarah, who are our funders uh, and who can talk to you about federal credit programs, public-private partnerships. We have other folks from DOT. We have Layla from uh, the Local Highway Transportation Assistance Committee, which is a, a, another Penwer partner, or accelerator partner, and they specifically help small governments in Idaho um, sorry, Idaho, uh, to write grants and, and figure out these very complicated, what we call NOFO, Notice of Funding Opportunities, very, very complicated application process as we heard earlier this morning. They do a lot of hand-holding and a lot of counsel and they've been very, very valuable. So you have a chance, and Federal Railroad Administration will be here, and they were here yesterday to meet uh, with the quarter applicants, uh, applicants, and so we have a big presence from the federal government here in Boise and you should take advantage of it. So that's from two to five and they might also talk about that at the lunch. So any final comments? Thank you, Bruce. One last uh, pitch for something that Valley Regional Transit is hosting this afternoon. If you don't have a tour plan, if you don't think you have time to um, sit down with the folks from the uh, Build America Bureau or the FRA, Valley Regional Transit is hosting a tour of the rail corridor in this region and the pieces of it that might be um, valuable for passenger service on a regional basis and not a long distance basis. So if you want a chance to get on a bus and go look at some of the rail, uh, meet us out front, we'll be out front, not out back. Our, our bus is taken off from in front of Main Street Station. I think we still have room and uh, would love to have a few more people on board. And with that, would you give this great panel another round of applause and we'll see you at lunch.